Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is yet another awful, tragic case that will make you so very sad and frustrated. When you hear the details of what this poor little girl went through, you will be just as angry as I am right now and when I found out about this case trust me. But before we get into this case that will surely raise your blood pressure and heart rate, let's talk about something that helps me relax, and that is Beam's Dream Powder. Beam's Dream Powder is a delicious chocolatey powder that transforms into a tasty cup of hot cocoa that is formulated to help you get your best night's sleep. I have the non-CBD dream powder, and let me tell you, I am obsessed. The non-CBD dream powder's formulation includes apigenin, which is a bioflavonoid found in chamomile that supports relaxation. It also has reishi, which is a mushroom superfood that helps to support the body's sleep cycle and manage stress. Then you have melatonin, magnesium, and L-theanine, all ingredients that help promote relaxation and achieve restful sleep. Beam's dream powder is formulated to help you fall asleep faster, stay asleep longer, and wake up refreshed without that morning grogginess that so many of us struggle with. There's no added sugar, it's gluten-free, dairy-free, vegan, non-GMO, keto-friendly, and it's only 15 calories per serving, so it really can fit in with any and all dietary needs. Dream Powder also comes in six different amazing flavors and various potencies, so you can customize it to your lifestyle. I have their classic flavor, Cinnamon Cocoa, which has been the best little addition to my nighttime routine. I love having something sweet and chocolatey before bed. In fact, it's a requirement for me to not go crazy. I need something sweet and chocolatey at the end of every single day. So this is literally the perfect little treat for me. They also have chocolate peanut butter, sea salt caramel, chocolate raspberry, white chocolate peppermint, or mint chip. If you are a regular viewer of this channel, you might know by now that I have always struggled with sleep. No matter when I go to bed, how much I exercise, how soon before bed I eat, I always struggle to get sleep and never have really felt fully rested when I wake up in the morning. But now with Beam's Dream Powder, I feel like I fall asleep so much easier and I don't wake up in the middle of the night as often as I used to. I feel like I can do so much more with my day now that I actually feel rested and have energy from proper sleep. So if you want to give Beam's Dream Powder a try for yourself and experience the beauty of restful sleep, subscribe now and you can save 20% off plus an additional 15% off plus a free frother by scanning the QR code shown here or click the link down below and use my code RACHELSHANNON. That is an additional 35% off from the original price. You can pause, skip, or cancel your subscription at any time so there is literally no risk to you. So again, make sure you follow the link in the description box below and use code RACHELSHANNON for an additional 35% off of your Beam Dream Powder. Thank you again so much to Beam for partnering with me on today's video. With that being said, let's get into this truly awful case. Today, we're going to be discussing the death of Christina Pangalangan. Christina Pangalangan was born on March 28, 2006 in Colleton County, South Carolina to Rita Frazier and Raphael Pangalangan, and she had two sisters, Ashley and Elizabeth. Christina was born with cerebral palsy, which is a congenital disorder that is caused by damage to the brain that can happen before, during, or after birth. In some cases, the child has abnormal brain development in utero, Sometimes it's from a lack of oxygen to the brain during labor and delivery. Those are the two most common causes that I personally have seen in my healthcare job. It can also be caused by infections that cause swelling and inflammation around the brain, either sustained as an infant or even if the mother gets that kind of infection while pregnant, or it can be caused by a traumatic brain injury sustained as an infant from something like a car accident or physical abuse. So, it's not necessarily a genetic or hereditary condition like a lot of people tend to believe. Obviously, your genes can contribute to it if you already have some genetic mutation that causes abnormal brain development, but it's not a gene that causes CP itself. More so, it can be a gene that causes some other brain development issue that can lead to the child having CP. The most common symptoms of cerebral palsy, which is abbreviated to CP, most affect the person's motor development and speech. 
So the most common type of CP is spastic, which means that the person will have super rigid and stiff muscles and joints. Some have high tone or spasticity all throughout their bodies, while others may have very low tone and are very floppy and weak. There are some very mild forms of CP, which will result in things like difficulty with normal gait, such as a super stiff leg on one side, but everything else, including speech and cognition, can be normal. Sometimes it can affect one side of the person's entire body, so they can have a super stiff left leg and a very weak left arm, for example. Some people with CP, though, you might not even know it. Meanwhile, a lot of people with CP have what's called spastic quadriplegia, and I think this is what people mostly think of when they think of CP. That means that the person won't be able to move their arms or legs very purposefully. They usually cannot walk, so they rely on a wheelchair. At least in my experience, these are the kids that usually don't have meaningful communication or speech. Usually, they'll need help with pretty much everything, including feeding, transferring from bed to chair or couch or wherever, using the bathroom, and a lot of times they will have some sort of communication device that helps them portray what they want or need to their caregiver. Basically, someone with quadriplegic CP will need round-the-clock care. I'm explaining all of this first so you understand the case a little bit better, but also because a lot of people simply don't know a lot about cerebral palsy. It's not always the people in the wheelchair or with cognitive disabilities. I have one child that I see in my healthcare job who is totally normal in everything with their cognition, speech, everything. They just have one spastic leg that makes the walking a little bit funky and makes them trip all of the time, but otherwise, this child is a totally typically developing child with speech and everything else. As for Christina though, she had spastic quadriplegic CP as well as a seizure disorder. This means that Christina had more severe cognitive and speech difficulties, which made it impossible to communicate via spoken language. She needed to use a wheelchair and did not have a wide range of purposeful movement. And what I mean by purposeful movement is they might flail around, they might have like writhing movements, but they're not going to like reach for a cup if they're thirsty. Basically, they have movement, they're not just still all of the time, but it's not very purposeful. Again, going to reach for a cup when you're thirsty. Either way, Christina was completely dependent. She did need a lot of care, but by all accounts, she was a happy child. Christina was known to be a loving, wonderful soul. She was unique and she was stubborn. She loved Dora the Explorer and SpongeBob SquarePants. She loved swimming and always got so excited when she got to watch her cartoons. She was 13 years old and a middle school student at Colleton Middle School at the time of her death. And once again, I know this intro into the case and into Christina and into her diagnosis is very long, but I just want to make a remark on how underestimated people with disabilities are. A lot of people think that because they can't communicate verbally, that they don't want to communicate or that they're not smart or that they don't have feelings, but they are so much more capable than anyone gives them credit for. It actually makes me very emotional talking about this because I work with children with disabilities in my healthcare job and you would be so surprised and impressed at what they can do. I know one of my kids that I treat has the same level of disability as Christina, and I know their favorite songs, their favorite music, their favorite toys. They communicate with me in a different way than other children, but they still will tell me when they're mad at me, excited to see me, happy or tired. I can tell them what I want them to do when I see them in a session, and they will do it within their limitations. So just as a little message to those of you out there who do or do not know somebody with a disability, or if you don't currently and you happen to meet someone with a disability in the future, don't underestimate them. They are so much more capable than you know. They understand a lot more than you know, and they feel a lot more than you know. Now, Christina's mother, Rita, worked as a teacher at the Thunderbolt Career and Technology Center in Culleton County, and during her career as a teacher, she was recognized twice as the county's Teacher of the Year. At some point, Rita's husband and Christina's father, Raphael, left the family and moved to another state. But despite that, Elizabeth, Christina's sister, said that Rita was devoted to continuing to care for Christina. 
After Raphael left, Rita took on a second job to help pay for her expenses. She helped Christina compete in a special Olympics competition and took her to Disney. She was even saving up money to buy a wheelchair accessible van to make transport that much easier. But at some point, it seemed that all of this changed. At the time of the incident, 53-year-old Rita had been in a relationship with 45-year-old Larry King. I don't know exactly how long their relationship was, but either Larry had a very bad influence on Rita or they both got involved in drugs together. I will discuss this more in detail later in the video. So, this case starts on August 5th, 2019. It was a hot day, reaching temperatures between 88 and 91 degrees Fahrenheit. At 11.16 a.m. on that day, Larry carried Christina out to the car that was parked in a shaded area in the front lawn of Larry's home just off of Low County Highway. And for the next five hours and 42 minutes, she sat in that car, alone, unable to move or open the door to get out or even use her voice to call for help. During that time, according to Larry, him and Rita had gotten into an argument, then they went inside and had sex, staying inside for almost an hour. After four hours in the car, Larry and Rita went back outside to get some cigarettes from the car. It was at that point that they realized that they were locked out of the car and weren't able to get in. They spent almost 45 minutes trying to figure out how to get into that car, trying to pry the door open and looking around for the keys. They also went to their shed and grabbed some tools to try and break into their car. They used a coat hanger to try and jimmy it open, but had no luck with that. So they sat around for a bit, waiting to see if they could think of anything until eventually they decided to get into Larry's truck headed over to Rita's house, about a 20 minute drive each way, and get a spare key from there to open the car. They then returned to the car about an hour after that, and by 5 p.m. that day, again, five hours and 42 minutes after she was put in that car, they finally were able to get Christina out of that car. But by the time they got to her, she had died. When they picked her up, her skin was hot and blistered, and her diaper had been very soiled. She had been left in that car to die, unable to breathe, suffering from extreme temperatures, which caused her to die. So, after finding her body, Larry called 911 to report that they had put their daughter in the car while they were getting ready to leave. Then, they accidentally locked her in the car because they couldn't find the keys. He admitted that she must have been in there for about one or two hours before they were able to get the spare key and get her out of that car. What's the address of your emergency? 911. Hello? Hello, 911. Oh, hello? Oh. Hello, what's the address of your emergency? I, I, I mean, I got emergency, man, like real quick. Okay, sir, what's going on? Where did it happen? Uh, my daughter. My daughter was locked in the car. We thought had to the car But they see she was. My girl locked the keys in the car. We had to run to her house to get the keys off, come back. And okay, uh, sir, what, what is the address that you're at, 11685, right there. Oh, God. I think she's so man. Sir, can please, you hear me? Sir, please. What is your name? Uh, please, 11685, Larry King. My name's Larry King. What's going on? Oh my God, please, please send somebody. I know there's Sir, a, what is uh, going on there? I can't understand what you're saying. Look, we, she got ready to leave earlier. My girlfriend, she put her daughter in the car, man. It's probably been a couple of hours ago, but had the AC running and all, we were talking. She went to get in, the damn door was locked and locked out. We tried, went to, uh, Walked to her house. Okay, and, so, uh, she's, got the, so she's locked she, in the vehicle, sir? Look, look, we went and got a, the a extra key fob. Got back, we couldn't find a key uh, entry. We okay, sir, is she bus. stuck in the vehicle still? We, look, man, we got out. She's gone, man. She's gone. I need Okay, you got her more. out of the vehicle? Is she breathing? Yes, she's gone. I'm sorry, Rita. I'm so sorry. <laughs> 11-685, Low Country Highway, man. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. 
baby. Oh, my God. Sir, how old is she? She's 12. She's 12? Yeah. Yeah. You think she passed away? I know she is, Bev. I got out the car. She's God. Okay, how long was she in the vehicle, sir? Probably two hours, man. Two hours? Oh, how, how long do you think she's been in the vehicle? An hour? I don't I thought, I mean, it, but we had AC going, Bo. We had AC going. We talked for a little bit. Didn't we? Okay, sir, and, and how long has it been since you got her out of the vehicle? Uh, Hello, I'm sir? Yep, so. How long has it been since you got her out of the vehicle? <sighs> Probably 15, 10 minutes. As soon as I got her out, man, I called you 10 minutes. I don't know, man. Since the time I got her, I called you immediately. <sighs> this is crazy. Oh, my God. How badly is she burned? Uh, she's got her. She's got her skin, man. It's, I swear. Yeah, it's bad. I swear. I don't know the guy. Oh, my God. Oh, okay. Lord, Do you know what me. burned her? I guess maybe, man. But she got, we got in the car. I don't bitch. She was in the floorboard, man. And the car, it's it, it done got, yeah, it's got hot, bro. Because, you know... Okay, Lord, you said the vehicle much. was running whenever you put her in there, Oh, yeah, 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 man, it was running. With AC running, with AC wide open. First responders arrived shortly after the call was made. When they arrived, Christina's body was lying in the grass, and Larry was standing outside on the phone with 911 while Rita was inside the house. At that point, attempts were made to save Christina's life, but unfortunately, they were too late. 13-year-old Christina was pronounced dead at the scene. Now, from the day that police arrived to the scene to question Larry and Rita and the weeks after, their stories would change multiple times. As we heard on that 911 call, Larry says multiple times that the AC was on. He was confident about that. Now, when police got there, the car was turned on and the AC was blowing, but the car was still hot. Two investigators, that told them that they had just turned that car on right before police arrived. Why? Probably because they knew that the car had been off and he wanted to make it seem like it was left on so that they wouldn't be suspected of killing Christina by leaving her in a hot car on purpose. Then they tried saying that there had been issues with the AC because obviously they probably realized that the police realized that the car was still hot even with the AC blowing when they first arrived. So they just said that there had been issues with the AC. Then they tried saying that there must have been an issue with the air conditioner. That must be why the car was still hot when police arrived. But no, when they turned the car on and left the AC on for the proper amount of time, the car cooled down as expected. There were absolutely no issues with that air conditioner. Then, as I just stated, Rita was inside when help originally arrived. Once they got Rita to come out, police spoke with her and got her side of the story. She told them that she put Christina in the car, then went inside really quick to grab some cigarettes, but when she came back out, she realized that she had locked herself out of the car with Christina inside. This was a total accident. So right off the bat, they're getting two different stories. Larry is over here saying that they knew that they put Christina in the car and left her there, but he swears the AC was on. Whereas Rita was saying that she didn't mean to leave Christina in the car. She just put her in there, went inside to grab her cigarettes before they planned on leaving, only to find that the car was locked. But it turns out that their statements actually didn't matter much, if at all because Larry actually had home surveillance cameras that picked up their every movement that day. And it showed us exactly what we needed to know about that day. So earlier, I gave you a bit of a snippet into what was going on while Christina was in that car, that they placed her in the car almost six hours passed, and when she was taken out, she was already dead. But when you find out exactly what happened and what they were doing while she was baking in that hot car, Oh, it just gets so much worse. Let me take you through a step-by-step -step narration of what happened on that morning. So, on the surveillance video, we see them carrying Christina out to the car at 11.16 a.m. on August 5th, 2019, 
and we see that they do not start the car after putting her in. Then we see for the next half hour as Rita and Larry argue on the lawn and then move to the porch to continue arguing until 11.43 a.m. They stay inside for about an hour before Rita comes back out at 12.29 p.m. She then gets into the driver's seat of the car, sits there for a minute, then gets back out. She opens the rear door to check on Christina and then shuts the door again. By 12.30 p.m., she goes back inside. She stays inside until 1.45 p.m. when her and Larry come back out and start arguing again on the porch. At this point, Christina has been in the car for over two hours. Then they are seen just meandering about until they hug and embrace each other at the doorway of the home before going inside at 2.03 p.m. It's at this point that Larry and Christina had sex. About an hour later at 3.01 p.m., they came back outside to the porch to smoke cigarettes and continue talking. By that point, Rita goes to the car to get some cigarettes, but realize that she has locked herself out of the car. By that point, Christina has been in the car for 3 hours and 47 minutes. Then, Rita and Larry walk around the car multiple times, trying to yank the door handles open to see if the windows are cracked or anything. They spend 10 minutes doing this. Then they wander around in the front yard for a minute before heading in the backyard to go to their shed and get some tools and try to get the door open. They used a coat hanger to see if they could get the door unlocked, but they were unsuccessful. After being unable to open the car, they sit on the porch for a while and swing together on the porch swing. They do that for another 15-ish minutes until they go back inside at 3.32 p.m. At this point, Christina has been in that car for over four hours. Then they walk through the house, go to the back, and hop in Larry's truck. They sit there for a few minutes before they finally leave at 3.52 p.m. to drive the 20 minutes to Rita's house in Walterboro. They finally return back at 4.40 p.m. with the spare key. But there is absolutely no urgency here. They sit in their car and talk for another four minutes before even trying to get into the car. They didn't get it unlocked at first, so again, they start wandering around the yard and hug and stand there for several minutes. Then they try rocking the car to see if that does anything, but obviously it didn't. It took them until 4.58 p.m. to figure out how to unlock the car with the spare key. I am not kidding you. It took them that long to unlock the door with the key. So finally, after five hours and 42 minutes in that scorching hot car, 
they get the door unlocked. They open the door and you can see that the window on the back seat on the driver's side is rolled up. So based on what we can see of the car, it looks like none of the windows in that car are open. That is when they discover that Christina is dead. You can see them panicking, acting frantically, not knowing what to do after they found her. Then they make that 911 call. Obviously, after seeing the surveillance footage, investigators were shocked and dumbfounded. They clearly had no regard for that little girl in the car. They checked on her one time. They didn't bother to even open a window in that car, let alone turn on the AC. Once Christina's body was found, of course, she was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The medical examiner ruled that her cause of death was the result of hyperthermia. Turns out that her body reached over 109.9 degrees, but that is the highest that the thermometer could read, so it's possible that her body temp was even higher than that. While she was in that car, she vomited on herself and then aspirated that vomit into her lungs as she was dying. And by the time her body was removed from the car, decomposition had already started. For those of you who don't know, a normal body temperature is about 98 degrees, give or take a degree. This is within safe limits. It is considered hypothermia, so being too cold at 95 degrees. Severe hyperthermia, when you're too hot, is when your body reaches above 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, think about the fact that Christina's body was five degrees above that. Think of your worst flu or fever that you've ever had in your life, how miserable that is, how you are sweating and uncomfortable and in pain. That is when your body reaches about 101 degrees, or if you have a very, very severe fever, it can get as high as 103 degrees. Only a few degrees can make a huge difference because it sounds like two degrees isn't that big of a deal in your body, but it is. Now imagine your body temperature being seven degrees hotter than your worst fever that you've ever experienced in your entire life. That is excruciating. And the fact that decomposition had already started not more than an hour or two after her death, that shows how freaking hot it truly was. After this, investigators did a study on the car to test the conditions at the same time that Christina was left in the car and tested how hot the car probably got during that time. They determined that the car most likely reached a temperature of 135 degrees Fahrenheit. You probably don't need to be from Arizona to know that 135 degrees is deadly. I'm really trying to hit home for you just how bad this really was. Now, you might be asking, how can two adults be so nonchalant, so irresponsible, so blatantly careless when a 13-year-old child is in that car? But it turned out that Rita and Larry were at the tail end of a three-day meth bender. They had been doing meth for three days straight, and apparently Rita hadn't slept at all in those three days. Blood tests would later confirm that they did have meth in their systems that were consistent with regular meth abuse. So mostly based on that surveillance footage that showed them leaving Christina in the car for almost six hours, Larry and Rita were both arrested and charged with conspiracy, murder, and causing severe bodily harm. The two pleaded not guilty, and their joint trial for murder started on August 29th, 2023. The prosecution argued that Rita and Larry treated Christina like baggage. They argued that they didn't accidentally place her in that car by accident and then just leave her in there. They deliberately put her in that car, leaving her in there for hours, knowing that she couldn't open the door. She couldn't yell for help. 
she was dependent on them to help her. They argued that her constant need for care was inconvenient for Rita and Larry. They couldn't just send Christina off to a friend's house when they wanted to be alone and do whatever they wanted. So, they put her somewhere where she wouldn't get in the way. And then, they left her there to basically boil to death. And while their daughter was dying an excruciating death, she was hugging and kissing and having sex with her boyfriend without a care in the world for her 13-year-old daughter. Now, the first day of trial, the prosecution called two witnesses to the stand to talk about how Rita normally treated her daughter. One woman was an 18-year-old aspiring nurse named Lindsay, who Rita had as her teacher in high school. According to Lindsay, Rita thought that Lindsay could gain some healthcare experience by helping her care for Christina. So, on a Friday, the week before Christina's death, Lindsay agreed to watch Christina on her own, thinking it would just be for a few hours while Rita went on a date with Larry. However, Rita did not return back to care for Christina until two days later on Sunday evening. She said that there was no food in the house and it looked like Christina's bed had bed bugs. She had just left her daughter alone with an 18-year-old who had no experience caring for a child with disabilities for the entire weekend without even so much as checking in. When she finally got back, she explained to Lindsay that Larry had suffered from a bout of food poisoning, so she had to be there for him for those days. Not like she had a daughter with a disability who needed her a lot more than a grown man with food poisoning did, but I digress. Now, on August the 2nd, did you have a reason to go to uh, Rita Payne Lane's home? Uh, yes, sir. And what was that reason? Um, to meet, to go over uh, her daughter Christina's routine. Uh, about her everyday living and all that stuff, taking why, care of her. Why did you do that? Um, because I was going to be watching Christina. Did you have any particular interest in, 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 in this? How did this come about? Um, because I was going to be a nurse, so they thought it would be best for me to, um, you know, kind of get the hang of her routine and all that. It might help me out, so I agreed, and that's when, when I went. Say, hey, who are you talking about? Uh, Rita. All right, so you go over there on the second with the idea of learning how to take care of her. What, what happens after that? Well, I just got there and we went over the routine pretty much. And then uh, she asked, Rita asked me if I would watch Christina while she went on a date with Larry. Which, Larry King? Yes, sir, her boyfriend. And tell me about that. She, she left the house, I'm assuming, sometime around that afternoon? Yes, sir. She, I would say about like around 5, 6 o'clock. That afternoon, she left. Was anybody else there to take care of Christina? No, sir. It was just you? Mm-hmm. Had you taken care of Christina before? No, sir. Did you see Rita Pangolini again? Not until Sunday afternoon. After she went on a date with Larry, did she say, I'm gone and I'll be back Monday or anything like that? She said that she texted me later that night to check on Christina. I would say about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. And then she said um, she would be back the next morning on Saturday to go grocery shopping and stuff like that, but she never came. And, um, Were there groceries in the house? No, sir. At any point in time, did she call to tell, ask if it was okay if you took care of the child? No, no sir. The next witness was a woman named Brittany, who had been a tenant of Rita's. This woman had been paying rent to live in a room in Rita's house, and while living there, there were several times that Brittany would watch Christina when Rita asked her to. But there was one time where Rita asked Brittany to watch Christina, but Brittany told her that she had to work that day, so she couldn't. But Rita was persistent. She told Brittany that she could just take Christina to work with her and leave her in the car with the windows rolled down because apparently, she did that all the time. So these two witness accounts tell me a few things. First, that Rita knew good and well that at the very least, if you're gonna leave someone in the car, the windows need to be rolled down. Not that that makes it okay, but it obviously means that she knew that the windows needed to be rolled down because she knew that it could get too hot in that car if not. But second and most significant, this tells me that Rita saw her daughter as an inconvenience who she didn't wanna deal with anymore. 
that was what the prosecution was arguing. Again, clearly, the house seemed to not be in the best conditions. She didn't really have food. She apparently had bed bugs on Christina's bed and was just trying to pass her off with whoever she could so that she could go out and do whatever she wanted. The prosecution also brought forward the medical examiner who testified about how horrific Christina's death was. She had blisters all over her body from the heat. She aspirated her own vomit. She started decomposing and had a ridiculously high body temperature. But the defense for Rita said that this case is not murder. It is a horrible accident that does have consequences. It is a nightmare, but it was an accident, not murder. Meanwhile, Larry's defense said that his biggest mistake was getting back together with Rita that Christina was not his child, so he did not have a legal obligation to care for her. They brought up how there have been other deaths of children who were forgotten in the car and overheated in the same way that Christina did, and not all of those parents are charged with murder because they are genuine accidents from overtired parents. But I do want to say that a lot of these other accounts are for infants, so people that just had babies that are still up all night with their children that haven't gotten a lick of sleep in months because their child is keeping them up all night and all of their energy is going towards caring for that child. Again, not an excuse for anybody that leaves their baby in the car, but there are people that genuinely leave their babies in the car by accident and it's because they're overwhelmed, overtired, and genuinely just did not think to get the baby out of the car. This is not the same situation here. This is a 13 year old. She had been caring for this little girl for 13 years. She's at the point where she's probably sleeping through the night, if not once or twice to get up to care for her. But otherwise, Rita probably got plenty of sleep if she wasn't doing meth all the time. Then Rita's daughter, Elizabeth, testified at the trial. She actually advocated for her mother big time. She said that Rita was devoted to Christina. Any time insurance denied an assistive device for Christina, which by the time happens so freaking often, it's absolutely infuriating, but that is a story for a different time. When that would happen, Rita would take up extra jobs like cleaning houses and taking on extra tutoring jobs just to pay for it. She said that Rita loved Christina and she would never do anything to harm her on purpose. Tell us a little bit about your mother. Yeah, so um, born and raised in uh, Walterboro. She raised me and my younger sister, so I was in the house uh, for a very long time when we brought Christina home from the hospital. She was the miracle that we've been praying for. It was very hard for my mom to get pregnant again after me. And so you were around for Christina's whole life? Yes, I, um, I was uh, the one that she looked like. She was my special person, five days birthday different, so we shared every birthday together. And again, could you describe your mother's relationship with Christina? Um, loving uh, Christina, never heard the word no. Um, every single month, every single time it was, we went out to eat, we lied and said it was her birthday because she loved being the center of attention and she loved music, so we, always lied to get that happy birthday song sung to her. And then um, people at Shoney's, they kind of knew us, so they, they, they knew our facade, but they were always happy to play along with us. What kind of special accommodations had your mother made for Christina? Yeah, oh my gosh, so many. Um, she, we always joked that Christina took my title as the bougie um, one in the family because when we did her bathroom remodel, not only was it all pink and door related, but because she loved the pool and hot tubs and bubbled, we had to splurge, even though I told mom it was way too much. Um, she splurged for the jetted tub um, and we had to like get the bathroom widened so her wheelchair can fit into it because since she was getting so big and so heavy to pick up, um, we had to have that special tub so she could just slide in from the wheelchair into the tub. And we got hardwood floors all throughout the house so she can, use her walker, there was um, a wheelchair accessible ramp we had installed and right before school started she had a new, she was just fitted for a brand new wheelchair um, for the beginning of the school year. How would you describe your mom's character? Who she is as a person? 
Was she a good person? No. How would oh. you describe her character? Um, she was my role model. I'm a, um, one of the reasons why I'm a teacher was because I saw her impacting lives of so many students. Um, she loved us so much, even when she dropped off me or my little sister at camp. Even if it was just for five days, she cried every single time. And she would write letters before we even left for camp, so that way the next day we had something mail time to look forward to. Um, even after I have got married, she would send care packages and coming back and forth to the house, um, she always made sure I had everything I needed. She would always wanted to, I raided her closet and her pantry many times. <laughs> um, and she just always made sure we had the best possible. She loved me, but she still loves me so much. And like, She's just so kind and caring and loving. And so just to make clear, as far as your mother's house, was it fit for Christina? Yes. Um, the whole, uh, we got the walker for her, even though insurance wouldn't pay for it. They said it was cosmetic, so mom would work extra tutoring jobs. She would clean houses. She made sure Christina had whatever she needed because the insurance often dub something unnecessary or cosmetic. So she made sure Christina had above and beyond what she needed. Did your mother have a lot of support? No. All right, this is final opportunity. You can tell them whatever you want them to know about your mother. My mom, she loved Christina so much and she's a good mom. She would often say that God created her to be Christina's mom because she was tough and she could handle it. And she loved Christina so much. She loved her so much. Thank you. No further questions, Ron. They also brought forward a witness who could testify about the blood tests that Rita and Larry took. They said that technically the amount of meth that they had in their systems could be residual from days prior it didn't necessarily mean that they had been on meth that very day, but again, they did show levels that are consistent with meth abuse. So even if they had taken it a few days prior, they probably still could have felt the effects of it days later that could have affected their sleep, that could have affected how they were thinking that day, that they just weren't all there because they were still on meth or whatever, or sleep deprived, whatever it was. They basically tried to argue that they didn't actually take meth that day, that it was from previous days. But to me, that doesn't really matter. They were still doing meth. They still exposed Christina to meth because there were witnesses who said that they did meth in the house, they did meth around her. So they clearly were not shy about doing drugs right in front of their daughter and exposing her to meth in that home. Other than that, I didn't see much else that the defense argued or that they could argue. It was basically just that this was an accident and not a purposeful murder. I also do want to note that even though Elizabeth advocated for her mom, other siblings and family members sat in the courtroom behind the prosecution to show support for Christina, not Rita. So after three days of evidence and testimony, the jury was sent off for deliberations. And after deliberating for just over two hours, they came back with their verdicts. They found that Rita and Larry were not guilty of criminal conspiracy, but they found that they were both guilty on the charges of murder and causing great bodily harm. As their verdicts were being read out, Rita was absolutely shocked. She gasped and yelled out, falling over, and started sobbing. Hey, if the defendant will rise, defendants will rise, and Madam Clerk, if you will publish the verdicts. State of South Carolina versus Rita M. Pang Delaney. We, the jury, in the above caption, on the charge of murder of Christina Ann Pang Delaney, find the defendant guilty. Oh my God! Oh my God! We, the jury, in the above caption case, on the charge of great bodily injury of a child, we find the defendant. Guilty. We, the jury, in the above caption case on the charge of criminal conspiracy, find the defendant not guilty. And the 
Yes. Signed by no, the four. you don't need to call the name of the four person. Signed by the four person. Do Signed not. by the four person. Yes. State of South Carolina versus Larry Eugene King. We, the jury in the above captain case on the charge of murder of Christina and Payne find the defendant guilty. We, the jury in the above captain case on the charge of great bodily injury on a child, find the defendant guilty. We, the jury in the above captain case on the charge of criminal conspiracy, find the defendant not guilty. At their sentencing hearings, Rita admitted that she was negligent, but she held on to the fact that she did not do this on purpose. In the end, Rita was sentenced to 37 years for murder and another 20 years for the charges of great bodily harm to be served concurrently. Then, Larry was sentenced to 32 years for murder, and he was also given a 20-year sentence for great bodily harm. It doesn't help me clarify in my mind who is the most culpable out of this situation or are they equally culpable? Are there, whose conduct was the most extreme? The mother who abandons her child in that setting and does nothing to rescue the child, who chooses Mr. King and her own pleasure over the child, or Mr. King who uh, throws the child, or he didn't throw a place of the child in the back of the car and, and, um, and shows no concern, compa compassion, or anything for the child, and in effect joins with uh, the mother in the treatment of the child. Though it wasn't his child, he, he initiated uh, his role in it when he placed the child in the back of the car and when he did nothing to get the child out of the car. Mr. King, it's a sentence of the court on the offense of murder that you be committed to the State Department of Corrections for a period of 32 years. Great bodily injury, the sentence is 20 years. Sentences will run concurrent with credit for any time that you've already served. Panelangan, you know, a lot of folks have said a lot of good things about you and a lot of positive impacts that you've made on their lives. Uh, you're not being sentenced to death. Your life goes on, but it'll go on behind bars, and you'll still have that same opportunity to make a positive impact on the lives of other people who you encounter, and I hope you do that. I simply cannot fathom a mother treating a child the way that you did and allowing that to happen to a child, to your child, the child that you birthed. I don't know if the child at some point became a burden. I don't know what the circumstances were that would lead you to placing the child in that situation and as if you left and went to Atlanta, Georgia or maybe we'll say uh, not Charles, to Myrtle Beach and went there and got in the beach for in the water a few hours and then come, came back and then uh, then decided that it's a frantic situation you did it. You have to live with it. And as bad as the conduct of Mr. King was, yours was worse. In my mind. The sentence of the court is that you be committed to the State Department of Correction for a period of 37 years on murder, 20 years on great bodily injury, Sentences will run concurrent and you'll receive credit for time served. After the death of this beautiful little girl, the public was understandably outraged.
people who knew the family had expressed concern for Christina's safety to the Department of Social Services, who did nothing to provide help or resources to the family. Christina's father, Raphael, said that he was devastated by his daughter's death, and he hoped that Rita and Larry would suffer in prison. He said that he tried to get DSS to investigate Rita's treatment of Christina, but they never did anything to help. Now, I don't know Raphael personally. I don't know the situation, and I'm sure he is devastated about the death of his daughter, but I do want to say that it doesn't seem like he did much to help care for Christina. It didn't seem like he was really involved in her life at all, so I don't know how true it is that he was really trying to get help trying to get someone to investigate Christina and Rita and how she was treating her because, in my opinion, I think if he cared that much that he would have actually tried to do something, went in the state, looked for himself. I don't know if he did that. I personally don't think he did just based on what I've seen. He totally could have. I totally could be off here, but it does seem that Raphael didn't really do much to help Christina either. I saw that he had warrants out for his arrest years and years ago for not paying child support, so it didn't seem like he was all that interested in helping care for Christina either, but that's beside the point. He's not the one who killed her. I don't want to sit here and talk smack about him when I don't know him, but I did just want to say that. It doesn't seem like either parent really had interest in caring for Christina, which is just awful. But either way, he has filed a lawsuit against DSS for negligence. He said that he hopes this lawsuit will expose their negligence and incompetence and hopefully prevent similar tragedies from happening to other children. So at the end of this, I do think that Rita and Larry are right where they belong. I'm happy that they were charged and convicted of murder because to me, I don't know if they put her in that car to kill her or if they just put her in that car without caring what happened to her. But whichever situation you think happened, both are equally as bad, if you ask me. They both clearly saw this little girl as nothing but an inconvenience and they did not care what happened to her. They clearly just wanted to live their lives carefree and without regard for Christina. And I think that was made very clear by that surveillance video. I am so outraged at these so-called parents that let this happen. I'm disgusted with what Christina went through when she was burning to death inside of that car. This is a death that I wouldn't wish on my absolute worst enemy. Nobody deserves something so horrific except maybe the parents that did this to her. Because clearly, they still think that their lives are much more important than taking responsibility for the brutal, awful thing that they put their baby through. But that is where this case sits today. Obviously, I could go on and on about how awful this all is and how heartbroken and angry I am for this little girl. She didn't deserve any of this, and I could just go on about how disgusted I am with her parents and how they treated her, but you all know and understand, and I'm sure you feel the exact same way. So that is where I am going to end today's video. Thank you all so much for taking the time to listen to Christina's story and for learning a little bit more about cerebral palsy. A lot of you might know that I do work in healthcare. I don't necessarily say exactly what my job is because I don't put too much personal information about myself out there for my own safety, but I do work with children with disabilities every day for my job in healthcare. I work with children of all ages, of all different disabilities, and cerebral palsy is definitely one of the most common that I see and treat, and it's such a misunderstood diagnosis. Pretty much every disability is not very well understood by the public, but cerebral palsy especially. So I just wanted to share what I know about it, what I see, and just, again, how capable people with cerebral palsy are in all disabilities, but especially for this case, cerebral palsy. But either way, I want to know what your thoughts are about this case. Do you think that Rita and Larry got the right sentence? Do you think that this was an intentional murder or more so neglect that led to death? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Make sure you turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok account, which are all going to be linked down below. 
And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.